Mexico of Shan, which was built in 1447. Next, the detail of it. Next. Is that lapis lazuli? It could not be. No. Because lapis lazuli can be used in the paintings, but you cannot use them in the kiln. It just turns gray. Mm -hmm. So what they had to use was cobalt for this wonderful tile work. This was actually a monument that was badly damaged in the British explosions of 1885. Nevertheless, this monument was left standing, but when the tiles fall, then the brickwork is left exposed to the elements and deteriorates. Now watch what happens. This is the way we discovered the monument in 1992. Just wrecked by war, fighting between the Soviets and the Jahideen. So another archaeological disaster. Next, the inside of the monument, pretty much contemporary with the Alhambra in Granada, with the mortar shell which went right through it. Next, a detail of one of the minarets taken just before 1978. Next, and the way the minarets looked in 1992. Stripped. Everything had fallen off. Next, the mortar shell, and one of the minarets decapitated, and you can see the ruins of Herat City, vegetation cut down, and the dust storm blowing through. Next. But it's an extraordinarily resilient country, and because the fundamental building material is so simple, mud brick mixed with straw, people are rebuilding everywhere, and those ruins photographed in 1982, <coughs> has now entirely disappeared. You go back to Herat, this is what you see everywhere. Or you see high-rises built by drug barons. But the ruins have been effaced. Next. OK, I just wanted to, to show the similarity between this and a picture painted in 1494, which is the next one, by Master Bizai. OK? building the castle. I want you to notice this. See that? Take the preceding one. You see that? See the technological difference? <laughs> Wheelbarrow was invented, I gather, by the Chinese. It's also some, the French claim it was invented by them in the 17th century. We take these things for granted, but somebody had to come up with the idea. Here, a wheelbarrow means you have to carry it with two people. <laughs> Next. Okay, this is the section of Herat which survived the uh, systematic Soviet destruction of two-thirds of the city, but there's an inner core that we're looking at now, the bazaar. Next. This is one of the very old sections of the city, not destroyed, so you can see some what these fearful old lanes could look like, and certainly not very sanitary. Have you all heard of something known, I think, by English travelers as the Aleppo Button? or Baghdad boil. You must be, uh, in Persian you call it sala donna. No? Okay, it's a, it used to be very prevalent in Iraq and Iran as well. And if you go to Iraq, then you'll see people of an older generation with a huge scar on half their face or on their forehead. This was caused by a parasite in the water which would lodge in the skin and create an enormous boil which lasts one year. And when it finally explodes, it leaves a tremendous scar. And this was very, very prevalent in the Middle Eastern area. And you have it, you'll have to, you still have a lot of it in Herat today. Next. Now one of the fearful old tunnels of very old Herat. Next. The uh, spice cellar in Herat. Typical shop, very typical. Next, <coughs> making bread in the oven, flat, flat loaves that we eat there. Next, the uh, jeweler in Herat. Do you notice who that represents in the picture there? That is Khomeini. The uh, city center of Herat is Shi'i. 
Herat was under Safavid Shi'i, Iranian control, for 200 years. And as a result, you have a countryside, which is Sunni, the immediate village ring around Herat, which is Sunni, but the core of the city itself is Shi'i. And one of the reasons why Ismail Khan became such a model administrator is that while Sunnis and Shi'is were killing each other in, in Kabul in 1994, 1995, we know that period, in Herat, Ismail Khan was going through the Shi'i sectors of the city in his open car and insisting on Sunni Shi'i cooperation, which of course made Iran very happy and which has allowed Herat right under American noses today to enjoy so much Iranian oil. So it's kind of a hopeful spot in the region. Next, the um, Quaf Bazaar in Herat. Next, salt cakes in Herat. Next, the um, carpet merchant in Herat. And this is what I'm talking about when I refer to the crafts of women. All these wonderful blankets, saddle bags, saddle blankets, what have you, all made by Turkmen women of the Herat area. This is 92 now, though it still exists. Yeah. Next. This also we took in 1992. This has survived the uh, carpet weavers. In this case, men using silk, which is a traditional Herati craft. One of the few places in the country where men weave carpets as well. Next. And this is a 15th century Herati carpet fragment when with Chinese influence, as you can see. And that's what they were that's what they meant when they were talking about the silk route. We actually have testimony from a Portuguese agent in the Persian Gulf dated 1507, who said that to the port of Hormuz, where the Portuguese were present, four thousand camels a day came from Herat loaded with bales of silk. Next. Music in Herat. Well, of course, this was taken just before the Taliban took it in 1995. Next. And this is a glass blower in Herat. Herat is still a very artistic city. Lots of crafts like this. It's one of the few places in the country which can produce, which you'll see in the next picture, the glass works. Are those modern designs? Yes, absolutely. It looks like some of the They look very traditional. Oh, so in traditional ones, you have that funny uh, spiral thing going Absolutely. Oh. oh, yeah. Next. They sell musical instruments, too. Uh, this was Master Mash'al, who until uh, 19, um, until the capture of the city by the Taliban in 1995, was hoping to revive the craft of uh, traditional painting. So he painted as he could. He represented Ismail Khan there, looking at his city. And he was one of our mid-99 patients. Uh, after 1995, the Taliban um, destroyed all his art. They whitewashed his frescoes in the town hall, and he literally died of a broken heart. Of course, the craft he was trying to revive was mainly based on what he saw from reproductions, like the, the next one. Now, that's one of the masterpieces of the 15th century Herat school. For those of you who are interested, in, and I'll, I'll teach the Sufism class, this painting, dated 1488, signed by Bazad, was one of the paintings that, through its inscriptions, allowed us to determine that, to the horror of the Wahhabis and the Taliban, the highest Sunni religious authorities of the 15th century kingdom of Herat allowed figure in the part and even considered it to be a vehicle for sacred symbolism. Don't make me go into it now because it would be complex, but it truly existed, flying in the face of conventional wisdom. But it just gives you an idea of the level of art that was attained by medieval Afghanistan. Next. This is a craft which has very much survived, the art of the calligrapher. This gentleman is dead now, but we photographed him before 1994. And take a look at one of his creations here. Next one. No, I'm sorry. This is a 15th century piece of calligraphy. And the next one is, is his creation. There, in the great mosque of Herat. 
the great mosque of Herat still 